Father Chris Alar is a priest with the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. He serves as Father Joseph, MIC, the Director of Association of Marian Helpers, and is the head of Marian Press. He also wrote and produced the popular Divine Mercy 101 and Explaining the Faith series. And so excited about this, you can catch Living Divine Mercy, a new series, every Wednesday evening on EWTN. And a fun fact, our adoption story, the journey to our beautiful Carolina in Poland is featured on the series. So stay tuned for that. But one of the most remarkable programs that I've been a part of to to record was when Father Chris joined me to talk about his book, After Suicide, There's Hope for Them and You. So also a very powerful work from Father Alar. So now honored to welcome him back to the show again to talk about understanding divine mercy as we celebrate the Feast of St. Faustina. Welcome to the show, Father Chris Alar. Thank you, Brooke. It's nice to be back at the shrine here of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, because usually I'm doing these things from the road in an airport or in a hotel room. So it's, so it's, you're at home base today. Yes, I'm back at the shrine of Divine Mercy. So um, we, uh, we're excited. Uh, you know, COVID has been a challenge for everybody, but it's allowed me to be able to be home a little bit more. So uh, praise be to God. And we're grateful for your work and so much of it. And I want to crack open the pages of this book. But before we jump in, tell us about your new series on, on EWTN. Yeah, we're excited. You're part of it. We've got some incredible stories. We've got Lou Holtz, the famous college football story coming up right out of the Cleveland area. We've got a story coming up, we hope, to be able to solidify on a guy named Zion Clark. Uh, born without any body below the the the, the naval area, it just an amazing group of stories that we are producing. We are not just taking YouTube videos. We're we're actually giving each episode. We give a teaching section where I spend a few minutes teaching on a particular topic. Then we have guests. Uh, we read from the Bible. We read from the Diary of Saint Faustina. We introduce you to Mary and priests and brothers. It's really become a fun show. Uh, uh, we're enjoying it, and you can catch it every Wednesday night at 6.30 on EWT, and that's Eastern Time. So Cleveland Time would be 6.30 every Wednesday night on EWTN. And if you don't have cable, you can stream it on EWTN.com. And as I mentioned, we had the wonderful opportunity and just to share with our listeners of welcoming George Foster. He came to our home. He is one of the video producers with the Marian Fathers. And he spent the day. We recorded a segment for the series. And and I am always ready anytime, anywhere to share our experience with St. Faustina, the intercession of St. John Paul II, all of our Polish saints and friends that led us to our daughter in Czestochowa, Poland. And in a time where the value of life the unborn has never been more devalued. I really believe her life, the miracle of how our lives were connected is something I believe, I hope can teach and soften hearts. And so when you're talking about Zion and the guests you have with the state of the world today, what perfect timing for this show. Yeah, it's um, unlike any show we've seen. Um, EWTN has done an incredible job over the years of educating us and teaching us. And what we decided to do with this show was create I wouldn't say a variety show, but in an essence, it's it's a it's a respectful variety hour. Now, luckily, you don't have to listen to me sing or dance, but or watch me <laughs> dance or hear me sing. But what you do see are some incredible stories of people that have had their lives changed by divine mercy. If you want to see our our last three episodes, there's two incredible stories. And then another one about an apostolate out of Buffalo, New York. But you can catch it on our our uh, our um, website, which is livingdivinemercy.org. So if you just simply type in one word, livingdivinemercy.org, you can see these episodes. And uh, they're only 27 minutes, kind of like your show, Airtime. Um, and so we put a lot in there, and it's fun. You can get to meet our priests and brothers. You get to hear from the Diary of St. Faustina. And most of all, you get to hear these incredible stories of people living divine mercy in their life. So let's talk about divine mercy. The book here that we're going to unpack today, Understanding Divine Mercy, is not super dense or heady. It's about 175 pages, including the appendix. But Father, I actually found it harder than I thought to find a starting point, because when I started to think about that, what is divine mercy? I am led to, immediately my mind goes to the image of divine mercy. 
the rays, the blood and water, the diary of St. Faustina, the chaplet of divine mercy, the hour of mercy, three o'clock, the novena, the works of mercy, understanding the, the theological definition of mercy. So it was actually really challenging to know where to begin. But you bring us so beautifully right into the first chapter, the simplicity. In short, you say, mercy is love. The greatest mode of love is mercy, and of all the virtues, the greatest is love, and of all the modes of love, the highest is mercy. And that mercy is a particular mode of love that leads to action. So yes. maybe starting there, um, it's it's an action. Yeah, and that's where God bless our our uh, Protestant brethren and our non-Catholic brethren, their love for Jesus, their understanding of the importance of Christ as Savior is paramount but where we differ um, from our catholics versus the non-catholics is in their understanding of works we have never stated as catholics that we believe that we're going to work our way into heaven okay we are not going to be able to write a check and give to the soup kitchen or even donate our time at the soup kitchen um, and think that that alone is going to save us nobody ever who understands full catholic church teaching would say that the Catholic teaching is that we are saved by grace. Okay. We, we, Christ merited that grace on the cross. The penalty for sin is death. I explained this in the book and the whole meaning of the mass actually, right. which was probably one of the biggest parts of the book. And people are like, father, I thought you're talking about divine mercy here. Well, it's all tied to that. So one of, one of the biggest parts of the book is explanation of the mass. But anyway, Christ merited because the penalty for sin is death. And when you sin or I sin, we deserve to die. I mean, this is just the reality of what God set us up, because th that's how serious sin is. Now, if you sin or I sin and we deserve to die, well, we either die or Jesus, we accept him in taking, you know, paying that penalty for us. Now, it's not... It's, it's not a sense that we can go on our way then and say, okay, Jesus did it all. And this is what the Protestant view in some cases is. Well, I don't have to worry about this. Jesus did everything. So I can lead, leave the life I want to live. No, that is not the teaching of scripture. What the teaching is, is the fact that we have to cooperate with that grace. Okay, so here's the thing. If, if God's grace saves us, you have to cooperate. I'll give you an example. You have a starving man. I can make him a dinner and place it on the plate and hand him the plate. That man is not going to survive without the food I gave him. That's like the grace of God. But he's got to cooperate and actually eat it. <laughs> if, mm -hmm. if, if he doesn't actually take the time to eat that food, he's going to die. The grace of God saves us, but we got to cooperate. Now, how do we cooperate? It's not just words. The scripture says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven. We have to cooperate with that grace through our actions. This is throughout scripture. Matthew 25 is probably the best example, the sheep and the goats. If we don't live mercy, then we're failing and we are condemning ourselves. God doesn't condemn us. We condemn ourselves. So sorry for the long-winded answer, but it, it ties down to this. If God if you look at, as you said, <clears throat> what, what saves us, we are saved by grace, but we got to cooperate. That's works, but not works of the law. It's works of love. Now works of love come in many forms. I can say something nice to you. I can hold the door for you. Um, I can help with your children. I, I can do many, many works of love, but and remember, the works we're talking about, as I said, are not works of the law, like washing your hands seven times or being circumcised. What we are talking about by works is works of love. Now, there are many forms of love. The Greeks told us there's, there's eros love, like romantic love, uh, sexual attraction. There is um, fraternal love, um, you know, that, that, that love between father and son. Um, there, there is that form of love, like a brother, but the highest form is 
is is is agape love. Now, what is agape love? It's completely giving yourself to the other. It's completely giving of yourself for the good of the other, even to the point of giving your love or your life. No greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for another. So here's the point I want to make. Of all the virtues, faith, hope, we know from scripture the greatest is love. But not all love is the same. Love could be eros, romantic. It can be um, fraternal love or, or, or the kind of love of father and a son. But the highest form of love is agape love. And when that love takes action, meaning I'm going to actually give myself to you physically doing it, that's mercy. So in a nutshell, what is mercy? Mercy is a particular mode of love, the highest mode of love. That when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. So what is divine mercy? It's when God saw our suffering after the fall, decided to do something about it. So he took action. What did he do? He sent the gift of a mother and the promise of a savior, and he redeemed us on the cross. So God saw our suffering. It's a particular mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. So divine mercy is when it applies to God. He did something about our suffering. He redeemed us. And going back to what you said about, you know, feeding the hungry man, you say the justice of God still requires satisfaction or atonement. And then you go into the ultimate remedy, the mass, like you touched on, and this going out and returning and how there's when he returns, Jesus is now I'm reading from the book, carrying us on his shoulders like the shepherd carries his discovered lost sheep back home to safety. Jesus is returning to the father, but he is now bringing us in our redeemed humanity with him and going to concupiscence, going to Adam and Eve and then healed and sanctified after Christ's redemptive act on the cross. So all of this, the Paschal mystery, everything working together. And so I want to clarify what mercy is and what mercy is not, that also mercy is connected to truth. I read a really good article by Ron Grondelsky, and he talks about, it was a pre-papal writing of John Paul II, and it was called The Problem of Truth and Mercy. It was written in 1957. But in the end, he asserts that mercy isn't about also ignoring divine justice or canceling out Jesus' command to go and sin no more. And maybe, you know, that's where we go into atonement. But, you know, mercy can't pretend, for example, that living in a sinful situation without a desire to repent is a good thing. So when we talk about mercy being a mode of love that leads to action for us, that also comes with personal responsibility on our part. Yeah. And, and one of the key factors of the feast of divine mercy, which is a, an incredible topic in and of itself next to the mass is probably the second longest topic I wrote about in the book is what is the promise of divine mercy Sunday? What are the graces of divine mercy Sunday? And Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus promises that the soul that's been to confession or now in COVID, if you're not unable to uh, an act of contrition um, and receives holy communion, or if you're bedridden and making an act of spiritual communion, that that soul will receive the complete forgiveness of not only all sin, but all punishment due to sin on this one day. And it's really a fulfillment of Yom Kippur, which in the Jewish feast was the one day a year called the Day of Atonement, where the high priest went and on behalf of the people received forgiveness of all their sins and punishment. And so this is a fulfillment of the Jewish feast of Yom Kippur. And so the beautiful part is this. Jesus promises that on this one day, the floodgates of mercy are open and you can, by going to confession, going to communion, receive a clean slate. Father Seraphim used to say it's like, and not is, but it's like a second baptism. You know, there is no second baptism, but he said it's like that, that your soul is wiped clean and your soul will never be cleaner other than the moment of your original baptism than it is on the day of Divine Mercy Sunday. That's why I always laugh. You know, people say, if I'm going to get hit by a bus, I hope it's right after confession. And I always say, 
Well, if I get run over, I hope it's after having been to confession and receiving Holy Communion on Divine on Mercy, Divine Mercy Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> and that's when John Paul basically died was right after receiving Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday. And I touched on that. But here's the thing. Even amidst all of that promise, even in the midst of all of Jesus's words, that you can come and be cleansed and basically made spotless, this doesn't happen without a rectification of the will. If we don't have a desire to change and at least giving the effort, in other words, I can't come to God that day and say, you know what, Lord, I'm still going to continue my affair, embezzling money, um, stealing, um, you know, uh, crushing people on my way to the top in my company. But, you know, I kind of like this divine mercy thing. It sounds pretty cool. Um, it's no, not just a trump card that you can yeah. do whatever you want. And it we know want. the ocean of mercy. But but in, in St. Faustina talks so much about that, uh, about the um, repentance and the reconciliation, the, the metanoia that, that we have to respond to. Oh, absolutely. In fact, it goes back to that grace. How did I say a second ago that we are saved? We're saved by God's grace, but we got to cooperate with that grace. How do we cooperate with that grace? Works of love. So wait a minute, Father, you say to save us, we need grace. True. But in order to receive that grace, you got to cooperate with it. Okay, Father, how do I cooperate with it? Works of love. Okay, got it, Father. Now, how do I do that? The highest is mercy. So the highest form of love is mercy. And so when we are merciful to others, we are exercising love in the greatest degree. And Jesus said in the diary, number 742, that he's giving us three ways to exercise mercy, word, deed, and prayer. And so when we do that, we've opened up his floodgates. The problem is you can't do that if you are not united to him in, in, in a state of grace um, if you're living in perpetual sin and you have no rectification of the will, no desire to change, this is kind of like God trying to plant a flower on a on a, si a cement sidewalk. It's the scripture says that that there's not fertile soil there for the seed to take root. And so all you have to do is just say, Lord, I want this. Um, a, the ABCs of mercy, as we talk about, the A is ask for God's mercy. And this is all tied together because a lot of people ask me, Father, what's the only unforgivable sin? Is it abortion? Is it murder? Is it, you know, is it blasphemy? What is the only unforgivable sin? It's the sin against the Holy Spirit. And what is the sin against the Holy Spirit? Final impenitence. What does that mean, Father? It means not asking for God's mercy. You simply have to ask for God's mercy. We ask, we will receive, and this is the whole answer. So this all fits together. So the ABCs, A, ask for God's mercy. B, be merciful to each other. That can be a tough one. And C, completely trust in God's mercy. Yeah, and we're these are the key. In fact, Pope Benedict said, uh, mercy is the nucleus of the Gospels. Um, and what is the, in the Adam and Eve fall in the garden, what were they lacking? They were lacking those three things. And throughout salvation history, God's been trying to teach us those three things. Ask for his mercy, be merciful I, to each other and completely trust in his mercy. That's really key because with divine mercy, with the revelations of, of St. Faustina and knowing that devotions are, are optional in the Catholic church, but in this sense, Divine mercy is is a message and a devotion, and yes. it takes us right to Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing that 98% of people, even Catholics, don't understand. We always get criticized that you're putting a devotion onto the level of dogmatic revelation. No, this is not just a devotion. First of all, a devotion to St. Therese is great. I love St. Therese. She's wonderful, but she's not God. First of all, this is a devotion to God, and that's not optional. We must have a devotion to God. Secondly, it's his devotion to us. You know, you look at the image of divine mercy. He's left foot is stepping forward. He's coming to us. And most importantly, you just said this. It's not just a devotion. It's the message. And Pope Benedict, as I said, clarified that, that the message of divine mercy is the nucleus of the gospel. In other words, 
you reject divine mercy, the message of divine mercy, you reject the, the gospel, and that's not optional. So we have to we have to take it into context of that it's more than just saying a chaplet. This is an entire spirituality. And Jesus told St. Faustina, divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. And and what is so extraordinary, yet not, because this is the way we see through salvation history, our Lord working through the most unexpected and unassuming in the most unexpected of places. And that, people. <laughs> and people, yes. Myself, oh, yeah. And, and I if think somebody of my daughter. Told me, if somebody would have told me in high school I was going to become a priest, I would have cried. I mean, there was just, it was not on my radar screen. So Sorry to interrupt, but you're right. He can work through the most unexplained people or situations. It's it's true, which just shows you his glory and goodness because it is it kind of defies explanation. And in this case, all of the themes we're talking about, deep, dogmatic, theological themes from St. Faustina, who had limited education, an unknown nun in Poland. And I want to talk about her because this is where the message, the message originates from our Lord, but through her and the Secretary of Mercy, as we call her, born Helena Kowalska, now St. Faustina, her faith, her poverty, her humility. And so our Lord comes to her February 22nd, 1931. Jesus appears to her alone in her cell. So what are we to make of this? Well, the first thing which I think was probably prudent. Her spiritual director says you need to have a psychological evaluation. And so it was determined. And I think that there again is God's grace because from the fruits and what we've seen from that first meeting in 1931 and the diary and all that has come branched off, take us, if you could, from, from that point. It seems so impossible that something so someone so hidden would would become known and loved the world over. Countless lives have been forever changed because of divine mercy, the image, the devotion, what St. Faustina wrote in her diary. So she receives this psychological evaluation. It's deemed that she is indeed trustworthy and legitimate. And through that, there was also a point where the diary was banned and then it was approved. You talk about that a little bit in understanding divine mercy. But doesn't it just astound you when you when you go and you trace it back, the fruits? Yeah, and it goes back again to the message and the devotion. So people say, well, Father, why was divine mercy not given until the 20th century? Well, first of all, divine mercy was given in the beginning in the garden, from the beginning instance of the fall of mankind. God could have squashed Adam and Eve into out of existence, but he didn't. He gave, as I said a minute ago, the promise of a savior and the gift of a mother. And so Genesis 3.15 tells us this. Now, God's been trying to give that message of mercy since the beginning. He's risen up great saints, great prophets. And finally, he gets to the 20th century and he says, that's it. Um, I'm done because I'm picking the person who will help prepare the world for my second coming. And that's St. Faustina. And so he called her his secretary or apostle of divine mercy. And what's so beautiful about that is of all the great saints, none of them, he chose her to be that person that he said, as I just mentioned, that will prepare the world, help him prepare the world for his final coming. Now, the question has been asked of us often, well, why didn't he do this a thousand years ago? Why didn't he do this 1500 years ago? All right. John Paul, or I should say Pius XII said back in the 1950s in a radio address that mankind is more sinful today than he was even at the time of the flood. And this was the 50s, the time of leave it to beaver. I mean, what the world, what in the world would he say about today that we've rewritten the definition of marriage, we've changed our sexual uh, uh, sexuality and our gender, we've legalized abortion, uh, pornography on demand, abortion on demand. Okay, you get the point. The point is, Mankind is more sinful today than ever because we have new ways to sin. People say, well, Father, man doesn't change. Okay, man doesn't. But, you know, a 14-year-old boy or 12-year-old boy didn't have the click of a mouse button 100 years ago to view some of these horrid things that we see, you know, on the Internet. So 
where sin abounds, God's grace abounds the more. And that's not just Faustina and the diary, that's scripture. So if this is going to be a time where sin is most abounding, if that makes sense, <laughs> this is also going to be the time where God's mercy is the most given. This is why Jesus calls this the time of mercy. He says, I am going to give mercy in this time in unprecedented ways, in unprecedented people. John Paul, Padre Pio, St. Faustina. These are our modern saints that have brought us mercy like never before, the greatest saints of our times. And so through Faustina, who he said he was going to use as the secretary, he's given us the devotion. Now that devotion, we talked about the message of mercy being the ABCs, ask for mercy, be merciful, and completely trust in God's mercy. You need that to get to heaven. That That's not optional. You know, if you don't, Bible says, if you don't, Ask for, you don't repent and ask for forgiveness. You don't get to heaven. Bible says in Matthew 25, you don't be merciful to each other. You don't love your neighbor. You don't give them those needs in, in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. You don't get to heaven. And most of all, if you don't trust, that's the biggest problem. You know, I mentioned in the beginning of this show that we are saved through grace. But Jesus made an interesting comment to St. Faustina that trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. So if you want to get to heaven, I want to get to heaven, we need grace. And there's only one way to get grace, Jesus said, trust. You have to trust him. So now those three things are mandatory to get to heaven, those ABCs. That's the message of mercy. But helping us to live it, God rose up St. Faustina and she gave, he gave her the devotion of divine mercy. What is the devotion of divine mercy, Father, that didn't come to the 20th century? That's five new channels of grace that he gave us to aid in our living the message of divine mercy. It's kind of like an athlete. He's judged by how he does in the game, but he's got to practice. Devotion is like the practice. You're going to be judged on judgment day by the ABCs, but you got to practice to live those ABCs. And so to practice to live those ABCs is the devotion of divine mercy. And how do we remember that? It's like the little acronym Finch, or I should say like the little bird Finch. The acronym is F-I-N-C-H. Very simple. F is the feast of divine mercy. I is the image of divine mercy. N is the novena of divine mercy. C is the chaplet of divine mercy. And H is the hour of divine mercy. So these are the new five channels of grace God gave to St. Faustina. Technically, they're optional. Yes, I don't have to do the novena of divine mercy to get to heaven technically. But I strongly suggest you do the devotion because it helps you live the message. And that message is mandatory to get to heaven. So I know this is a lot to throw at everybody, but it really is incredible how it all comes together. It is. And that's why I really recommend the book, too, because you break down, again, the feast, the image, the novena, the chaplet, the hour, the finch, as well as the ABCs. And I'm really going back to something you said, and I wrote it down when you said it, and that is that we are finding new ways to sin. And that really made my blood run cold because it's true when you look at, I mean, oh I, my people gosh. have Contra contraception, um, you know, uh, pornography on demand, live streaming now, um, cyber sexual relations. I mean, there's just ways to sin now that didn't exist 200 years ago, even a hundred years ago, abortion being legalized in the last hundred years. Um, these are the seeds that the evil one has planted that have have created chaos. And again, going back to the Lord's words, where sin abounds, I'm going to give you my grace. My grace will abound. abound. Right. Right. And also mixed with this nihilistic society that is very uh, relativistic. And then I also was thinking when you said that about trust 
And I recently post this picture of my grandma and her little flower group from many years ago. And you would just kind of look at that and maybe scroll on by and think it's a group of old ladies in their church coats. But these were the special forces of the faith. And boy, were they masters in the school of trust and of suffering. And I also was thinking the manufactured counterfeit ways that we put our trust in things, because we also in our day and age have things that give us the illusion of trust, that we think that we can trust our health, our government, it's our funny. paycheck. Our money. And, right. When our structures are falling away and we're seeing people with anxiety and panic, you realize, what am I putting my trust in? And so what a perfect message for a time right now. And you say the exclusive mission of St. Faustina's life was trust in the mercy of God and plead mercy for the whole world. And this is key. You talking about the, the final coming. So there's an apocalyptic aspect of this as well, um, I guess. And so, so take us into that because it also ties in, it seems a little bit to the message of Fatima to pray fast sacrifice. And this Finch, you're giving us a roadmap here. Yeah, and, and that is, like I said, it's the practice <clears throat> to perform in the game. We're judged on those ABCs, but the Finch is the way to practice it daily. And the beautiful gift in those five channels of grace are so extraordinary. I mean, look at each one of them. Um, you know, the chaplet, uh, Jesus says, priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. You know, you prayed at the side of the bedside, and Jesus will personally um, take that soul on behalf of your prayer. I mean, that's intercessory prayer to the max. Um, we we're talking about the feast uh, we mentioned a minute ago where all your sins and, and punishment due to sin can be wiped away. Um, this is an incredible gift. I boil it down to, and I explain this in the book, the, the entire connection with the mass. Everything goes back to the mass. In the mass, um, we as the church, the church fathers have taught us this for centuries. We are the bride. Um, we are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride. Who's the church we are? And uh, the symbolism in this is extraordinary because um, if we are the wedded bride of Christ, um, what does every bride and, and groom do? Well, they prepare. The groom gets all prepared to meet her, her I'm sorry, the bride gets all prepared to meet her groom on her wedding day. And, um, and, and wants to, the groom wants to take her home spotless, this virgin spotless to take home to meet his mother and father. And that ties to the significance of when divine mercy even is. It's placed on the eighth day. And so Jesus was emphatic to St. Faustina that this feast had to be on the eighth day. Well, what's that mean, Father? What's the eighth day? Well, a celebration in Jewish tradition um, was always that if a feast was so big, the most important feast couldn't be celebrated in one day. They would celebrate them over eight days. And what's incredibly important is that Jesus demanded, he didn't request, he demanded that Faustina have this feast placed on the Sunday after Easter. Easter is day one of the Easter octave. So if you have Easter Sunday, day one, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Divine Mercy Sunday is the eighth day. And that completes an octave. Now, why is that important? Well, while seven is the perfect number to the Jews, it's regarding time and creation. But the number eight to the Jews actually represented eternity. And so Jesus wanted eight, the eighth day of Divine Mercy Sunday, to represent eternity. What does that mean? That's the day Jesus, the groom, is going to come for us, the bride. Well, what do you mean, come for us, Father? Your death. Jesus is going to come to you at the moment of your death. That's your eighth day. <laughs> You're entering in. You don't have nine lives. You have eight days. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, you're going to enter into eternity with Jesus at that time. And the problem is, is he going to find us spotless? Because Jesus wants to take us home to meet his mother and his father. Now he's Jewish. What did every Jewish man want his bride to be? Spotless. The problem is, we got the stain on our souls, on our wedding garments. What's our wedding garment? Our soul. That needs to be cleaned. Now that stain comes in two forms. Sin, and the result of sin is the punishment if we don't atone for it. And Divine Mercy Sunday 
wipes out both of those. And so if Divine Mercy Sunday wipes out both of those, we are spotless so that when Jesus comes on the eighth day, which is Divine Mercy Sunday, symbolically, we're ready to go to heaven with him. I mean, this concept is absolutely incredible because Jesus wants so bad for us to enter heaven that he's willing to give us a way to become completely spotless, even if we've been rolling around in the mud puddle and our, our wedding garment is filthy. He's coming and saying, as my bride, I'm going to make you spotless so you're ready to come into the wedding feast with me. And so we do. And that's Divine Mercy Sunday. Get spotless, get cleaned, wipe away not only the sin, which is one stain, but all the punishment, which is the other stain. And you are now ready to enter into eternal bliss. I mean, the concept is beyond our imagination because our God is that merciful. And again, this life-changing, soul-saving truth from a nun who had very limited formal education and the the theological depth and layers are so profound. It seems impossible that she could have known. I mean, I know she had visions. She had a vision of her canonization that happened. I mean, the, the, the prophecies and the visions are so extraordinary. It's easy for someone to say, oh, this is just superstition or someone from an outsider. But no, when in for you as priest, where you are there in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, it must be remarkable when you hear these deathbed stories and the moments of mercy. I know from my own dad, as he died the last week in hospice, it was all that I could say was, Jesus, I trust in you, and to repeatedly pray the divine mercy novena for his soul. It must be so edifying for you to hear these true stories of yes. things that are really unexplainable. And it's even more edifying to hear people such as yourself that have taken the time and the effort to learn this. Because remember, you cannot love. The, Thomas Aquinas teaches us the intellect precedes the will. You cannot love what you do not know. And so if I want to truly love someone, I have to come to know them. This is why we don't marry, usually, the person we meet on the first day. We don't marry on the first date because we got to get to know this person. So to truly love somebody, you got to get to come to know them. And so the beautiful, you, you, the beautiful thing is when you take the effort to learn about God's mercy then you can love him any more, even more. And God says that it's that love that opens your heart to trust him. So in other words, knowing him leads to loving him, leads to trusting him. And that's the goal. Because when I love somebody, I'll trust you. If I love you and you say, Father, um, I really need you to get in the car and drive here. I can't tell you why. Just trust me. Well, if you're just a random person that I have no respect for, I'm going to be like, well, I got a tons of things to do. I'm really sorry. I can't. But if I truly love you, well, first of all, I truly know you and I truly love you. Then I'm going to trust you. I'm going to say, all right, you said, don't ask. I can't explain it. Just trust me on this. I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to come. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Come to know me. You're doing that. You read the book. Come to love me. You're doing that in your works, your works of love. You're merciful, being merciful to each other, consoling the heart of Jesus on the cross. Then you can trust me. And so when I when I come to love God, I can trust him. People think the love of God is the end all get all. It is because it leads to trust. It doesn't and matter that, if I love you if I don't trust you. I mean, I have to trust you. You're just underscoring here what I want to highlight as we conclude, and that is the suffering element because we trust him with all, and especially in our moments of suffering. Here in the diary, Jesus was suddenly standing before me, it says, St. Faustina, stripped of his clothes, his body completely covered with wounds, his eyes flooded with tears and blood, his face disfigured and covered with spittle. The Lord then said to me, the bride must resemble her betrothed. I understood these words to their very depth. There is no room for doubt here. My likeness to Jesus must be through suffering and through humility. So we should not fear suffering. And it's uh, the Lord of the paradox. I've always called, you know, the first will be last, the rich will be poor. Um, our Lord of the paradox is saying that my suffering through the cross led to your redemption 
if you offer up your suffering and unite it, this is St. Paul in First uh, Colossians, that I must unite my sufferings, uh, or excuse me, I must complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. Well, what could possibly be lacking in the sufferings of Christ? Our sufferings. We have to unite that with his. And when we do that, we become, as John Paul called us, mini co-redeemers. Now, we didn't redeem each other. We didn't redeem ourselves. But we can participate in the redemptive act of Christ, which is on the cross, when we unite our sufferings to his. So this is the power of, you know, when God gave us free will, he took a huge risk that we would use that free will to turn against him and not love our neighbor. And so when we when we do that, the suffering that's a result of that is a consequence of our own actions. It's not God inflicting punishment. Um, in God's ordained will, he doesn't want sick, sickness, suffering, and death, but in his permissive will, he allows it so that we can grow from it. Sometimes the only time people turn to God is in a moment of tragedy. If everything was perfect, if I had everything I ever needed, all the food, money, health, everything I ever needed, where's why is there a need for God? If I had the most money, the nicest house, the prettiest wife, if I had the greatest health, if I had everything I ever needed and never experienced suffering or tragedy, why would I need God? There would be no reason. So sometimes he allows us to experience that so that we can feel what it's like to share the cross. There's a wonderful um, Eastern mystic, Ignatius Baranachov, and he talks about how the chalice is given to us from a loving father. It is not an, an angry master, but Jesus drank himself first, trusting, oh Lord, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. And as you shared in your book from St. Faustina's diary, that we must emulate the, you know, the, the, the bridegroom. And so we know this valley of tears, that suffering is a part of life. And you share a very powerful story of great humility on your part of being confronted by a man who lost, I think it was his niece, but it was a young girl to leukemia and really confronting you in a public place because he saw your collar about that, the suffering, the senselessness of it all. And as old as time is, it's something we still grapple with. And I think that is also why that last chapter, we could spend an entire show on alone, the suffering and the mercy of suffering for us. So again, just that line, Jesus, I trust in you and how it all works together. Any final words about that, about um, suffering and why mercy is so linked with suffering? Yeah, because it is the suffering of Christ that allowed his mercy to be poured out of his side on the cross when he was speared and the blood and the water came out. Remember, Satan only has two tools, uh, sin and death. And um, sin, what is the result of sin? Death. Those are his only two tools. Now, what wipes out sin? The cleansing waters of baptism and confession. That is the pale ray. What wipes out? Death. Satan's other tool, life. And what was life to the Jews? Blood. And so when you have the blood and the water come out of the sacred heart of Jesus and people are like, well, Father, it came out of the side in scripture. No, when Jesus was speared on the cross, that spear went through the chest cavity and punctured the heart. So the blood and the water that came out of his side actually came from his heart. That's why this is all connected to the sacred heart. The sacred heart, divine mercy does not replace the sacred heart. It completes and fulfills it. Why? Because the sacred heart of Jesus, God said to St. Margaret Mary, I am love, come to me. But in the sacred, or that's the sacred heart, but in the divine mercy, Jesus said that love is now being put into action. I'm coming to you. And so he pours that love out on the cross in the form of the blood and the water. And that's why divine mercy is a complete fulfillment of the sacred heart. In the sacred heart, God is love. And what is the divine mercy? Love in action. So it's, it's taking the love of the sacred heart and now putting it into action. And that's an important note, too, that uh, divine mercy completes the sacred heart, that it, that it all works together. Uh, I really recommend for anyone that hasn't reading or rereading the diary of St. Faustina, I can say for me, it, it changed my life. And, and one of the things that I think about, I try to remember periodically, especially as we are going into a season of, of Christmas and the gifts and all of that, is that 
St. Faustina was poor. She came from a poor family and, in fact, didn't even have a dowry when she entered the convent. And I remember when we picked our daughter up in Poland from the orphanage, all that she had in the 11 months of her life was contained in a brown paper bag. That was it. And it was just the contents of a crib sheet and a few bottles, and that was it. And how we are free when we are detached of things. And it's a painful stripping sometimes to know that we should not put our trust in anything else. And it has to be a muscle. I think we continue to work. But what you've done here, Father Elar, not only in this book, Understanding Divine Mercy, but I think in your so many other um, ministry projects that you do, including the series on EWTN, is that you give us those breadcrumbs along the way of others who have are like stars in the night sky who have been there, who have received those graces, consolations that we are not alone. And that I think helps our trust in a time where we don't, there's a lot of fake news. We don't know what to believe. And, um, you know, even those of us who have been tried and have been lifetime Christians, sometimes, I mean, we can be a Thomas. So I think it's so important again, to just detach and affix ourselves to his side and the blood and water and all the finch, everything that divine mercy has to offer us. And understanding divine mercy is out now, right? It's in, yes. I don't know if how yes. many editions you have a new one yeah we've got the newest edition out um you can get it on amazon or better yet our own website uh that, that uh, the proceeds 100 percent go back into our ministry and that is shopmercy.org and so feel free to get it at shopmercy.org and you can even call 1-800 the number four Marian, M-A-R-I-A-N. So please pick it up. I'm, I'm very uh, pleased, uh, Brooke, that you were able to comprehend it. I think it shows that, um, you know, the importance of this message was the fact of your own reaction to how critical this message is. And um, and so thank you for reading it. And and you've grasped it very well. And even though God's mercy is kind of funny, we call it understanding divine mercy. But God said you can't understand him in his essence. But he did say to St. Faustina, you can come to know me through my attributes. Well, wait a minute. What's an attribute? The best or the greatest of God's attributes is Mrs. Mercy. So we come to know God through his mercy. He told us this. So it's a beautiful way to begin. If you get this book and you couple it with the diary and the Bible, you've got really everything you need for a spiritual life. That is a powerful arsenal. That's right. And a chaplet, your rosary, you are good to go. That's like the best Christmas thing you could give or receive for sure. And um, I love the catalog too. So I will I will do a whole link in the show notes of everything, including the YouTube page. And of course, you can catch the EWTN show every Wednesday, Living Divine Mercy, right? Half an hour? 6.30, yep, yep. Okay. Okay, God bless you, Father Chris Alar. And we will uh, continue to support and pray and ask for God's mercy as you do your work and um and we just thank you for your time yes and a blessing to all of you 